Hi, everyone, and welcome to Legal Tech Matters, my latest podcast. I'm Caroline Hill, Legal IT Insiders Editor, and I am joined today by four experts in training. Uh, I am joined by Joanne Humber from Humber Associates. Hi, Jo. Hi. I'm joined by Rachel Baden from Square Pattern Balls. Hi, Rachel. Hi. I'm joined by um, Bonnie Buth, who is from uh, Fort Harrison. Hi, Bonnie. And last but not least, Dorigan Sykes, who is from iTrain Legal. Hi, Dorigan. Um, I am so grateful for you joining me. I would normally ask you to introduce yourselves, but because there are a few of us and we've got so much to get through, I'm going to run through an introduction of each of you. Uh, to everyone listening in, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my panel today really are some of the leading legal tra legal experts in, in training. Um, and we're going to be talking about both uh, training as a career for women in STEM um, and getting a little bit of insight into how my panelists have got to where they are today. But we're also going to be looking at, um, we're really going to be leveraging their insights into what firms are, law firms are doing well and what they're doing not so well in terms of training. Um, so first up, so in, I'm saying first up in terms of how I can see you. <laughs> I should point out. Um, so Joe, as I said, is from Humber Associates. Joe is the marketing consultant for legal industry training and proficiency body legal technology core competencies certification coalition. I did it. <laughs> Which is otherwise better known as LTC4. Um, you'll see Joe at all of the conferences. Um, Joe's a really well-known figure and based in the industry. She's over 25 years of experience of training. Yes. A long time. It's a long time. Uh, and that's just, that's across professional services organizations, isn't it? That's legal, finance, and property. Yeah. Although I know you best from legal. Uh, Bonnie is, as I said, from Ford Harrison. Um, Bonnie is now, has changed the title. She is the learning and development specialist. Um, Bonnie is a founding member of LTC4. She's currently board chair and US treasurer. And at Fort Harrison, Bonnie manages the design and delivery of courses to support key technology initiatives, consistently helps to reduce disruption uh, from the firms uh, when the firm's rolling out new applications across its many offices. Uh, Rachel, as I said, is from Squire Pattern Box. Uh, Rachel is the Global Technology Training Manager. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in the tech training industry. She's also a founding member of LTC4. Uh, she's also on the board of directors and is UK treasurer. Uh, and at Squire Pattern Box, Rachel's accountable for strategy and leadership of the legal tech training team, as well as ensuring that lawyers and staff have the technology skills to do their jobs and practice in an efficient manner. Um, and Dorigan, uh, again, all, everyone on my panel is a very well-known face at, at, at conferences. Dorigan and I have hung out at many conferences. <laughs> and we, she's the founding uh, founder and managing director of iTrain Legal, uh, which many of you will know is a leading uh, provider of IT training and change management services to legal. And they work with LTC4, but also um, some of the most prominent legal software suppliers. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining me. We're going to, I'm going to hand over to you all in a second to talk about yourselves, which is the most important bit. But um, I just wanted to, for people listening in, it really does have three parts. So we're going to talk about training as a career, particularly for women in STEM, where we think that it's a really excellent career. And we're going, my panel is going to talk to you about why that is. Uh, we're going to talk about the issues that firms are facing um, and really delve into some of the insights there, um, perhaps some of the mistakes, and then how they're getting things right and how this, actually training could be a massive opportunity. And we're going to look a little bit about um, some of the return on investments that that, that that they can see if they do it right. Um, over to you, really, to talk about your background. So I want to understand, um, you've obviously been doing this a really long time, and I know all of you feel really passionately about training and how it's a great career for women. Let's talk, perhaps start with Joe again, if we go in the same order. Joe, talk to me a little bit about your career, how you ended up where you are now. I started actually by setting up a training center in my local town um, a long time ago, and it was business skills. Um, and then increasingly people were asking for technology skills as, as a computer started to be introduced into offices. And my first project was a law firm in my lucky town who wanted all their people to be trained how to use a computer. And that's really was where it started. 
And ever since then, more and more work has been on in the media industry. But it also involved me working for corporate. If we were implementing our knowledge that happened, so I did a lot of projects like that. So I've been to around law firms and other professional services firms, definitely training projects for a long time. Long time. Uh, uh, Bonnie? We uh, started out as a legal assistant and in a help desk for a law firm, and I was working my way through school getting my computer information systems degree. And, you know, I took the usual path when I graduated from college. I went to work for Arthur Anderson. I was a business analyst. I did some application development. I went on to a couple of other companies where I managed financial applications. And, you know, companies go out of business and... IT departments get eliminated. And, you know, when that happened to me the second time, I thought, well, I really wanted to combine my legal experience with my IT experience. So I started looking for opportunities. And a recruiter that I was working with actually told me about Ford Harrison because the CIO at the time said he really wanted somebody who could come in who could implement their learning management system and really kind of make the role their own. And that was how I merged both my legal and technical experience. And and that's really been very beneficial. Okay, thank you. And and Rachel? Well, yeah, mine's a a bit of a a different story. Um, I was studying media at college and I thought I was going to journalism. That was my thing that I wanted to do. Uh, and when I finished college, I took up an administration job and it was for an NVQ. So I was just doing some office admin. And I happened to see um, an advert at the time and it obviously wasn't online. This was back in 98, I think, um, for a, a post for a IT trainer. And this was just for a training provider. And I, at the time I had in my head, right, I want to go and live in London. So I was just, just turned 19. When I had my first interview in, in London for a trading provider, I remember my dad took me on the bus because we couldn't even afford the train at that time. And I obviously just had the attitude because we said we couldn't believe that somebody had come in um, who would deliver that way with no formal background. So that's how I started just as a trainer and we were training all public and private sector. And as I was getting more established in, in that career, I just had this thing that I wanted to go in house because so much with training, you don't see the benefit because you train people for a day or two days and then they go back and you never see them again unless they come on with a course. So I started looking at posts and I really fancied going into legal. Don't ask me why. It just sounded a really interesting area uh, and to working house. I did get made redundant. And then at that point, I did a little bit of contracting. But it really wasn't for me. It can be quite lucrative, but just wasn't for me. And then at that point, I saw a role for a firm called Hammonds. Um, and that was back in 2004. Uh, and then that's when I went in-house. Uh, and since then, my career's took off. But that's how I've started. The rest is history. And, and Dorigan, I'm going to come on to you first next time, Dorigan. Let, what, yeah. Tell me about your background. <laughs> well, I, I, before I entered legal IT, I, I've done a lot of different things. Um, I... Oddly, did a drama degree. So, um, and then I did my postgraduate diploma in law. So, um, I was kind of heading down the legal route, but I, for various reasons, I decided it wasn't for me. And and I ended up um, in technology. Um, so, my, interestingly, the four of us have all come into it at a different angle. And I'm actually from the T of STEM. So, I, I became a techie. Um, I worked in help desks and then in technical support, in incident management, problem management. I was, very um, very focused on the technical side. But what I found was the part I loved was when um, somebody that you were trying to explain something to really got it and actually it really helped them with what they were trying to achieve in their job. And, and that satisfaction from being able to help somebody with technology to achieve something that they needed to achieve was, was it, it was what made my job really worthwhile. And funnily enough, it's, it's now what we look for in trainers is that that joy in helping to get to that light bulb moment, which is what which what really drew me into um, IT training as opposed to any other part of technology. And um, when I got the opportunity to, I was in Australia at this point, 
pin back to the UK, I, I saw an advert for DWF as their IT trainer and I thought, okay, let's give that a bash. <laughs> the reason why I picked a law firm is quite mercenary. They were paying more than anybody else. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought, um, let's give this a go. And I got I got lumped with the 3E project at, at DWF, which was um, you know, quite a baptism of fire, but they say you either sink or swim, and I, I just loved it. And and you know, the rest is history. In some ways, you know, I um, like Rachel. I, I made my way through, and and um, years later, when I had the opportunity, I, I was able to to start my own business. And right. Do you think? I mean, we're going to talk about. I, I do think. Um, it's interesting to talk about the women in STEM angle, particularly as obviously, you know, all women, but um, also because we want to find as many opportunities to bring more women into the sector. Um, but do you, for that reason, do you, do you think, um, I'm going to talk to you about what, what skills newcomers need, but I'd also like to reflect on what you just said, Dorgan, about, um, you know, c- the communication skills. Is, it, is there something about training that do you think lends itself particularly towards women? Hi. Not necessarily. No, I mean that there is a there is a higher proportion of women in in training, particularly compared to any other type of technology um, technology based role, I suppose. But when we recruit, obviously we're not interested in the gender of somebody. We tend to find that we're we're coming up with a fifty fifty blend, really. Um, so, and and our male our male trainers are just as proficient and passionate and and uh, you know interested in helping people to um to achieve what they want to achieve with technology so i don't i i do think it's perceived that way though um and i think that that's why we tend to have that 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 bias towards um towards females at an it training level but then as with so many different industries the the women aren't always always brought up to given the opportunities at, at higher levels to, to to progress that career, I suppose. So in the same way as a uh, secretarial workforce is often predominantly female, you don't necessarily see them um, rising up to more managerial positions or or, or, or different roles within organisations. Okay, so so what do, you, what do you newcomers need in terms of aptitude? And that could be, given that I've just asked you, Joy, and it could be you or anybody, what, what skills... Do you think um, newcomers, Philip, for people listening in, thinking, "Oh, hey, you know, um, could, this could be something for me," and and we're going to come on to talk about why this is re- training is more important than ever, and really it should be a growing role. But so for anyone listening in, thinking, "Well, hey, this might be for me," so what what skills would you say newcomers need? I think they need. Um... Sorry, Bonnie. Sorry. Just a, a few. We do a quick word, a quick word for Durgan, and then I'm going to get Bonnie. <laughs> Then they need to be passionate about technology and about helping people to achieve with technology. And um, we'd like to see that light in their eyes, that light bulb moment where you know you want to help somebody and you felt that you have helped them. But they need to they need to love technology as well, really, and love what it can do. They need to be have an aptitude, have a have an ability to learn quickly. The communication is so important. You, you need to listen, really listen and understand what people are trying to achieve. And you need to be a little bit of a translator. So you need to be able to understand what's happening on the technical side, translate that back to the users. And the same way, you need to understand what they're saying and 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 feed that back in so that systems can be um, configured and designed in the way that people need to use it. It's so much more than just a training role, but I think we'll probably come on to her. Yeah. I'm actually going to come on to... I'm actually going to come to Bonnie for something slightly different because I know that... Um, you said about um, that, that, talking about the type of, that training isn't just training, if it, it, as it were. So you really need to be aware of the firm's business needs and that, and that in terms of what training achieves, that people go, oh, it's training, oh, it t- teaches me how to turn <laughs> things off or not. But actually, Bonnie, talk to me a bit about how the role, you must be able to respond to business needs and, and what the benefit might be of training. Well, and this really relates a lot to to what Dora Jim was just saying about pulling people into the career as well. You know, I noticed when I when I was offered this position at Ford Harrison, I really had to think about whether I wanted to take my career in that direction. 
And I started thinking about the fact that even as a business analyst and even as an application developer and a financial systems person, I was always educating somebody else. And so when it comes to skill sets coming in, having a global business understanding and having an understanding of how technology impacts your users is a skill that people from a number of different backgrounds, as we've seen today, you know, can, can leverage that. Um, ultimately, you have to know the best way to, to be effective and to give a return on investment and to expand your career really in legal IT training or IT training in any industry is that you have to understand the business and have that training answer those business needs. You know, one of the biggest business needs is to protect securities. And so it's important, no matter what you're teaching, that you take all of that into consideration. So it isn't just somebody handing you, you know, a curriculum and saying, okay, train this. It's as a trainer, you have to have an understanding of how the business operates and to seek out what you would want to train and how to structure that training to answer those business needs, whether it's profitability or security. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. We're going to come on to talk about the security angle more in terms of the where perhaps lack of training might be a real issue when it comes to security. But Rachel, tell me, so before we move on to those issues, um, so in terms of the career part of it, I know that you feel quite passionately that you need to get involved it's in the same way as I would encourage, to be perfectly frank with you, anybody to really put themselves out there and be, you know, be visible. Um, and I have to say that sometimes as women, I think that that's one of the things that we don't do as much, which I would encourage any woman listening to do more, be put yourself a bit more on a pedestal. Anyway, but you, I know you feel that, you, you should be there should be a broader awareness of training and that perhaps you 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 need to get out there and 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 to be more involved in the industry is that right did i summarize that well or but maybe how do you feel yeah i mean i just want to go back on a point if anybody is listening about wanting to get into this role that there is a much broader spectrum which you know answers your question it's not just about training people um there's a whole host of project management work course development all the learning technology side of developing e-learning videos there's just so much you know looking after the learning management system reporting the role is very very broad and i think it's important when you're in a law firm that you're yes you're in technology but really to what bonnie was saying is you're working with the business you're working with the firm you've got to know who you're key stakeholders are in the business so they know what you can offer them and they will come to you and you get that dialogue going where it doesn't matter if a project's coming out of technology it's coming out of finance it's coming out of marketing you're involved at the beginning and you get that seat at the table because they can see the value that you bring and also that ability to be able to roll out um, applications or systems to lawyers and staff because I think to Dorigan's point it's about speaking the language of the lawyers and in you know if we look at technology there's always that thing about the tech speak and it's two different languages and you know we translate that we provide the context so you know we provide that real world so that people can adopt those systems so I think it's really important that you get yourself into that position where you become that go-to person all course also can help with client facing work as well. We've had a couple of pieces internally in my firm where we've helped practice groups create content for external um, systems that our clients are using. And that's been received so well. And the cost savings from that rather than going out to an external person. And we've obviously just using the soft cost. So, you know, it's really important as a training professional in legal that you know who your key stakeholders are, you communicate and you take a proactive approach. Um, rather than waiting for people to come to you, you've got to get yourself out there. So is that is that training clients to use their technology effectively? Yeah, well, it was our, it was something that we developed for a client. So, um, right. you know, the content, we, deli uh, we delivered some 
uh, short videos and means by the clients. And it did win an award as well, which was... <laughs> I find and that so... I mean, I've sorry. heard of instances where um, clients have actually requested help with their training from the, the law firm training team because they don't have one of their own. So it's an interesting area, which is probably not exploited that much. But certainly if you're a smallish company and you don't have those skills, uh, it's a it's a way of the law firm providing an added value. I'm hearing about this more and more. I'm funnily enough discussed it on a different podcast. It's it's that that sort of thing is falling increasingly within firms' legal operations teams, and so it's part of their value add. But I think I think it's an interesting, probably conversation, maybe to, to, to sort of just go into more with, another time with you. But you know, I do think it's obviously something which is quite sticky, and it helps you know the the clients feel loved and everything. I do think it's an interesting one, but um, in terms of whether a big law firm should be teaching their clients how to use Word. But then, you know, I think obviously it, it, it could be something that really, you know, as I said, sticky. But so um, in terms of um, issues, so uh, we've talked about security. There's so many firms who don't, I imagine, you can all jump in at this point um, and agree, <laughs> uh, don't spend enough on training. It's interesting because they spend tons on software, they spend tons of technology, a lot on people to implement them. And then... I imagine that because people are always described as the weakest link, that if you don't train people, you can have you can spend all of the money on security that you like, but if you don't spend enough time training the individuals not to do something stupid or or how to actually use the technology in the first place so that they get value out of it, you might as well almost to be deliberately <laughs> what's the word um, contentious, but you might as well not spend the money at all. Is that a fair s- assessment? Yeah, I mean, there's also a huge risk involved. So while you've spent the hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds on the software, if people aren't using it efficiently, there's risk from a security point of view. There's also risk in just quality of documents and quality of work that's that's, uh, sent from that firm to the client. So I think, yeah, I mean, there are massive uh, implications if people are not using whatever technology you've got efficiently. I think one of the things, you know, we're in back, you know, firms do invest lots of money in technology and firms are investing in the training. They do, you know, they have training teams, they're investing in the training. But what I'm seeing is more the, the uptake from the users. That's what you hear more, that they're not engaging with that training. And I've been chatting about this, I think, with Joe and Bonnie and others. It's our firms actually giving people the capacity to learn because it's all right, you know, we're rolling out a new system. This is the, um, you know, the time investment that it's going to take you. But if you've got a really busy lawyer who's on a closing, anything to do with training will go to the bottom of that list. And you know, you've got lawyers potentially with burnout. And you know, at the end of the day, they maybe want to go home and you know do something else, not have to log back on and do their IT training to catch up. So I think there's a real question. Or, you know, some more exploration, maybe not for today, but around, you know, as firms, are we giving people the capacity and that it is okay to take that time out to learn because, you know, that short-term pain is going to give you a much longer-term gain. Well, and I think that on Rachel's point, you know, with more and more firms trying to look at return on investment in, in terms of hard dollars, when it comes to training, I think that ultimately that may start the conversation about isn't it, doesn't it make sense to designate time or, or make a path for where that training can take place or a method? I know one thing that LTC4 focused on early was defining core competencies and learning plans along the lines of workflows instead of features and functions so that someone could more directly take the training and then actually do the technical job that they need to do. So I think, I think Rachel, when it comes to more firms looking at return on investment, I think you're absolutely right. The next conversation is really going to be how to, how to make a place for that training to take place in firms. I do wonder, there's been all sorts of talk about the progress. I mean, I've been writing about legal the legal sector since 2004 
and we've been talking about the billable hour since then and nothing has really changed but i think recently there has been progress i think that and i think that probably i mean again probably that's another deep dive but you know, as people move away from the billable hour more or or find ways to create time, create capacity for people, I do think that that will make a difference. I think at the moment, the culture of law firms um, is quite a struggle in terms of finding time for people to do anything other than billable hours, whether that be pro bono or training. And I think billable hour is also part of the problem, isn't it? Because um, if you... <laughs> you're rewarding incompetence in some ways, and I think this is where LTC4 made a stand didn't it and said you know like actually what we need to do is prove the competence of our lawyers so that that, that our, our clients don't think that we're charging them for our own um lack of lack of ability to use the the products that we have and therefore taking three times as long to to produce a document than, than they should do so yeah the billable hour is 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 a challenge give me before we move on to um uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick example, but so so you think of, maybe think of you know what are the funny you know things that people have done in training that cost that spent so much, yeah, you know, created so much um, time or took so much time that didn't need to be. But so I'll, I'll give I'll give you an example. I had a mentee who um, was absolutely brilliant, intimidatingly brilliant actually at tech, and she said to me, she her colleagues didn't know how to use Control F. And so they were going through, and I know this is such a simple thing your word. I don't know how often you come across this, but they were going through manually, like thousands of pages and manually going through and reading through and finding this one word because they hadn't been shown how to use control F. And I was just like, oh my God. Are there lots of examples that you come across where uh, firms may not even be aware that their trainees or their lawyers are doing these sorts of things? I think one of the most interesting things you can do is to actually be out on the floor talking to people. Of course, since people have started working from home more, that's become quite difficult. So we talk about virtual floor support now. So in other words, you, you're, you're able to see what people are doing, but you're doing it virtually. But there are lots of things that people do that take far too long. And they would save matching the but, Time if they just spent half an hour learning that skill or spending half an hour with a trainer. In fact, some law firms are doing individual consultation with people and they're allocating an hour and say, make a list of all the things that you struggle with and let's resolve them now. Because it is extraordinary how much time can be wasted. Something like that is classic. I should have I said control left place actually, but I know you know what you know what I meant. When they're they're actually what? replacing a word and Thanks. they were going through a Mm. Anyone else got any disasters before we come on? We're going to talk about p positives. We're going to talk about competitive edge and best examples. But um, so I presume I think you must just have loads. But let let's say um, I suppose because of time, I I just want to before we come on, um, we might overrun slightly. But so do you, do you think um, before we come on to best examples of, that you're seeing of where firms are perhaps gaining a competitive edge? Um, do you think there'll be a day when in legal when training? won't be required we talk about the apple effect we talk about how we don't need training to use all sorts of things now within the consumer world does anyone think that we won't need training eventually or do you think that day will ever come no i don't think that we won't need training i think training is ultimately going to go more in the direction of on demand so you need to do something you click a button it tells you how to do it and i i think part of that started even with the pandemic people who didn't have immediate support, couldn't go shout out and ask their legal assistance or whatever. I, I think I think training's gonna lead more not so much to not need it, but to have it more on demand. Yeah. Um, so you, you go, Rachel. Oh so well, you're gonna be like this. That was stumbling over one another. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to be quick, Rachel, because we're just okay. coming to the end then um, yeah. I was just that? gonna say I just think it won't they won't come a time because I just think training part departments have to evolve and adapt. And I think there's document automation, AI, there's metaverse, there's so much coming that it will just, we'll still need a human intervention. So people will need to know how to do it and there'll still be business process and there'll still be best practice. Dogan, to, to counter the Apple argument, Apple had billions in, in research dollars to be able to make their software and their programs as intuitive as they can be. Microsoft is in a similar way, but the vendors within the legal industry do not have that level of investment in making things seamless and 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 you know just easy to pick up and use that that doesn't exist we're so far away from that it's not funny so 
it may come in the future, but I don't see it in the next five years becoming anywhere near the level of intuitiveness. Yeah. And I actually think with Microsoft, because Microsoft has billions, but Microsoft is a, a, the example I gave is Microsoft. Based. Um, now, to, let's quickly talk about um, examples of, you know, positive examples of training that you're seeing. Anyone can jump in. I know that, Dorigan, you wanted to talk about ROI. Um, t- tell me a bit about that. It's a difficult when, when you're implementing software to, to demonstrate ROI. And because it's not easy to demonstrate, it, it sometimes is, is not is not seen as a, a, a metric with, within the success factors of a project. So you can measure whether it's on time, whether it's on budget, whether it's um, to the specification that it's meant to be. But how do you measure whether it's been adopted um, properly? And, and that challenge of not being able to easily measure ROI I think is, is part of the downfall of it not being seen as something that you can you can easily judge a project by. And it's not because it's not tangible and it, it doesn't shout in your face when the project doesn't go goes in that it, it's it's going to be a problem. It's like a longer term issue with the software where you, you never actually realise your investment because the people just aren't using it in the way that, that it was designed to be used or that, that you thought it was going to be used to start off with. I think um, I think it's a challenge for us all. We were in a, a meeting yesterday. We were all talking about how do you demonstrate ROI because I, I think our industry needs to probably look at ourselves and, and find ways in which we can start to put these metrics around what we're doing and, and, and show show the figures behind it, what the, what the cost is, the real cost. Right. That's where LTC4 does provide a method because there is a method of assessment at the end of each learning plan, which actually leads to a certification, but it also shows that competence has been achieved. So delivering training is one thing, but actually proving competence at the end of it and that there has been a change in the way that person works, it, you know, it's important to measure it. And that's not being done really before until LTC4 came along. There was no method of doing that. There was no standard. There was no sort of level at which uh, training could be proved to have actually worked and, and made an effect. So Rachel and Bonnie, just to wrap up, um, perhaps Rachel first and then Bonnie, do you, th- do you see, um, with examples or not, um, do you see firms training being used as a to provide a competitive edge? And if so, how? Well, I think those that are adopting the, you know, I know I've mentioned LTC4, but those are the ones that I've seen as most successful when I'm listening to law firms and I hear a lot from a lot of law firms that they're able to put that in as a competitive advantage, you know, based on maybe other law firms that are not looking at proving efficiency and competency. Um, and I think those, you know, that train with context and they look at workflow based to the ones that are being successful. I think as Bonnie mentioned at the beginning, I mean, feature and functions went out well over a decade ago. So I wouldn't expect any law firm now to be training features and functions. They'll be looking at the workflows and teaching them to use the technology to practice law. So that's Bonnie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you know, I, I really think the competitive advantage has more to do with with how a firm manages that business side uh, and integrates training into their business decisions, you know, it it can make them more efficient. It can make them more secure, and they can certainly advertise to the external world whether they do it through a certification uh, or whether they simply make it clear that they embrace good technology practices in order to accomplish those business goals. You know, that that helps their clients look at the firm as good business people. You know, they run their own business well. If they run their own business well, they're certainly going to provide better support to their clients. I think but from that standpoint, it, it's, you know, proving ROI, is, and Story has said, you know, can be a challenge and it can be hard to tie that to an actual number. But I think any firm that really embraces addressing those business and security needs and can prove it has a business advantage. Yeah. Well, I hope eventually we'll go the US route and we'll have some kind of need, you know, necessary accreditation, um, you know, that as they do in many of the states. But 
So for now, we can we can dream uh, in the UK. But <laughs> um, but listen, we we're out of time. Uh, I really appreciate all of your thoughts um, and insights. Uh, so Joe, Rachel, Bonnie, Dorgan, thank you so much, and hopefully we'll get to speak about training again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for listening to Legal Tech Matters. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.